is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Elder Empire, C, Book Two of Dawn and Darkness, chapters 20, 21, and 22. In these chapters, Calder has had it. He has had it with Kellerak. And he tells Kellerak to, like, basically get fucked. And as much as I felt like this was an incredibly bad move, I can't help but be impressed. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to George for commissioning this episode. George, if you're out there, what's up? Um, so, yeah, these chapters, this was like one of the longer sections that I get to read for this book, which was lovely. Got to really soak in. And this section was full of moments that didn't go the way that I pictured them going. First of all, the fact that Kellerak came to Calder to try and make a deal at all genuinely surprised me because I kind of thought Kellerak would know Calder had had it like enough and would have realized in the way that Jirene seems to realize he has burned that bridge and that is all there is to it. And the attempt to make the deal could be part of him toying with Calder. It may not have been a sincere attempt, but based on his attitude when Calder says no, it feels like it really was him trying to make a deal. So it remains to be seen, but I can't help you guys, you know, I'm a cautious person most of the time. I also have too much respect for authority figures, which has like gotten me into trouble in my life and made me very slow on the uptake about ACAB and whatnot. But um, I can't get over that Calder genuinely is like, you are going to pay for everything you did to an elder, a great elder, to his face. I mean... And the fact is, and I said this in the link when I posted for this, like, broadcast, Kellerak has almost no reaction to Calder saying this to him, because that is how little Calder matters. Like, Kellerak is so confident that Calder is nobody, and that he has no real free will or power That he doesn't even really get angry. He's just like, would you just go and keep doing your bullshit thing that you do where you act like you have power? And the fact that he doesn't even like rise to the anger, have any sort of response directly to what Calder is saying is more evidence than anything that he is as powerful as he is has been rumored to be and look we've seen what Calarac can do we know about his power but there's just something about and i i have said this actually before um when you are reading something and there are people who are sort of meant to be like godlike or ancient beings and they have reactions to things that feel really really human sometimes that can be a little bit difficult for me because i simultaneously want to be able to understand the way they're feeling. I want to be able to relate to them on some level so that I can understand them as a character. But also, I I want to feel like they have reactions beyond what I understand because they are beings beyond what I could ever experience. And that can be... Like, this was a problem that I had with the Iron Druid series. The main character in that series is supposed to be, like, thousands of years old, but he acts like a bratty frat boy a lot of the time. And it just didn't really work for me. There was nothing about him that 
implied in the thousands of years he was alive that he had ever learned anything or grown as a person. He felt like the same 20 year old, you know, Calorax total non-reaction to Calder is so not the way a human would react that that cemented for me how little I really understand about Kellerak altogether. I've been sort of looking at Kellerak like he's a really devious used car salesman. Like he's somebody that's a threat in the way that people who scam you are a threat. Like you guys who play Animal Crossing, you know about uh, Red who sells the fake art. Honestly, Kellerak was giving red vibes for me a little bit. And even though I saw him do incredible things, even though I knew that he had power to just appear and disappear places, create these massive, like, these flesh prisons, literally not just talking about human bodies. I knew that. But there is something about how completely unthreatened he is here that has underlined for me a whole vibe that I was failing to really get. Um, so anyway, I just, I, as impressed as I was with Calder, and I still am, I'm not taking anything away from him because of Kellerak's response. Calder had no idea how Kellerak would react, and he still said what he wanted to fucking say. And that takes balls. And I'm not mad. However, Kellerak not even maintaining the facade of like, oh yeah, maybe you'll be able to do something. Not even humoring him in any way. That is the moment that I have been the most scared for Calder. And when Calder basically gets dropped back into the world, it feels a lot like they're the only option that Calder could pursue to thwart Kellerak in a meaningful way, would be to let himself be killed or kill himself. Because the implication from Kellerak is just, okay, I guess you can pretend that you're not doing my bidding. If that makes you feel better, you are and you always will be and you literally have no choice in that. But if you want me to like lie to you, I can do that. You can lie to yourself. Have fun. It does not change what's actually happening. And... Considering that the whole thing with Shara is that she is still alive when she was meant to have been dead. Maybe Calder being dead when he was meant to have still been alive is the one other piece of the puzzle that will stop whatever it is the elders are trying to do. And I say this with no joy in my heart because I don't dislike Calder. I don't want him to die. But I don't know what the fuck the elders are doing here, man. I don't get their game and it doesn't feel like it's as long term as I want it to be the long term that makes me feel vaguely safe and there's something else going on with that whole like long term thing as well that comes up a little bit later that I will address so we start off with him in the white armor that we find out later is like capable of protecting him from a lot more than just physical damage as they roll up on the Grey Island, and he notices that the giant wall of fog is not there the way that it had been. And he's sort of wondering what it could mean. And most of the things that he thinks of are to the benefit of the consultants. He doesn't see, oh, the fog is gone. That means they're more vulnerable. He sees that the fog is gone, and he thinks... Are they doing this to increase visibility for their cannons? Are they doing this because they've abandoned the island entirely and they're not even there and we're wasting our time? It's all, he thinks, part of their, like, playing an advantage. And the fact that we know, it's just kind of a, a sad accident that fucks them up a bit. And he thinks it's a strategic thing that they've done on purpose and they're making the most of is kind of delightful honestly. Um, so the, the long and short of it here is that he finds out Joran Mays Walker is on the island 
And he has a very strong reaction. He knows this guy from reputation. He is just like, oh, word. And he has lived through the Elder War. So even though Calder may not know much about this guy, just the fact that he's still alive is pretty much enough. And Teach says, Tearfang recognizes its creator. And Calder is like, oh, God. He made her weapon? Like, Tearfang is really intimidating and to the average person that would be enough to get them to back off but if he made it he knows what it is and what its tricks are and that's super bad for us so we don't even really have that advantage and as we see because when we are in Shara's book we see the fight begin between Teach and uh and Joran but we don't actually get to like watch it to the end Shara gets distracted, gets a whole other thing happening, and she pursues that line. So when we watch more of that fight from Calder's perspective, Teach is on the back foot. And I was genuinely surprised at how close to losing she looked like she was. But he comes up with a whole plan to sort of get in there and make use of himself as a distraction, really, is what he does. Um, and I love when Teach says something about, like, we may be able to, like, hold him back. And Calder thinks Teach is referring to herself and him. And she's like, no, ew, it's bliss. Come on. And he's like, oh, right. Yeah. Um, and Bliss accuses Calder, who had not noticed her there, of not paying attention to her surroundings. To which he says, I don't see how that would help. And I don't know why I found that so funny, but truly, Bliss is like, there really isn't a point. She's just going to do what she wants and show up where the fuck she feels like. So he is correct. Um, so this is when Bliss says, someone has been considerate and removed Bastion's veil. If it stays gone, I can release the full extent of my ability. I can eliminate the island if you like word don't love that i st i'm not i'm not entirely surprised because the extent of what what bliss can do when she's trying not to do it is already very scary so if she puts her full effort into doing a huge I want to say destructive thing, but it isn't in the eyes of like the elder she seems bound to. It isn't destructive. It's just changing a thing. But I'm going to call it just destructive because in effect, that's what happens. The idea that like she could maybe turn this entire island into like, I don't even know, a huge couch. Just very scary, man. Bliss remains intimidating in a way that I simultaneously want to know more about but also feel like if I find out more I am not just going to find out about the cool badass stuff I'm also probably going to have to find out about some like really disturbing fucked up stuff that I would rather not know and I can't decide how much knowing more is worth how bad is the fucked up stuff there's no way to sort of edge around that part probably not um <laughs> so she, Teach asks Calder to try using the crown and he has a horn that he's using to project his voice and that shit does not do anything it's really interesting to me actually because the whole implication of that is that nobody is faithful to the Empire anymore that particular weapon has been robbed entirely of power and this was a power reminder that last book had carrion attacking shara like very powerful shit and now it's doing nothing and i really enjoy the way that will white has made this weapon so effective but contingent on a very very specific thing and if that one thing which is quite significant, but still very singular, changes, 
that's it. And this weapon just straight won't work anymore. It might work on other people. If you went into like a city and he said this, probably it would work on like the populace because to a degree, they are still thinking the old way, I'm sure, at least some of them. But here on this island in the midst of this attack, nope, not doing anything. Um, and <laughs> the fact that it doesn't do anything... It isn't even really a big problem. Calder's sort of like, yeah, all right. It was really more of a long shot that they were hoping would do something, but they weren't really fooling themselves about it too much. Um, so they send a bunch of Imperial guards to storm the beach first, and they make sure to use people who are altered in some way, that they are going to have massive protection against physical damage. And there's a series of like all chemical explosives various traps all kinds of things set up to slow them or bring them down um and one after another gets set off at one point he's like is that bees because they're like slapping at themselves and um every time that a group goes through these like obstacles the group behind them can go through no problem. So it's not like they remain active and continuing to attack. They are spent after one wave, which, I mean, it is a little bit surprising to me, but also the way that magic works in this universe, I, I still don't quite feel like I have a great handle on. And I may have a like if you had asked me in theory how this would work I think I would have assumed there could be some weapons that were invested by readers that could work more than once and that for an island as important as the gray island that they would have used that sort of weapon here and when I step back and think about it if this island had been surrounded by Bastion's Vale as it normally would. I guess it makes sense that they don't think they need a ton of protections of that nature. I just wish that the consultants had considered Bastion's Vale is gone. Maybe we should put some other things in place. But I'm also failing to really keep hold of the timeline here because in my mind, Bastion's Vale went down months ago. And as we know... It really was only, what, like a week? It, the fight that happened there and now, this fight, it feels like it's only been like a handful of days. And I may be wrong about that, but I am sort of wanting them to put more in place to protect themselves. And really, they probably didn't anticipate that there was going to be another confrontation this soon. Um, so anyway, oh, I'm sorry, Asher is all these comments. Men can go 40 years of their life not maturing if they choose. I'm not so sure it's a stretch to say they could manage it for a thousand. I love Bliss so much. Just the casual way she threatens people makes a significant impression on how likely she'll be able to carry out. A lot of people would work on how they say a threat. She's just like, yeah, I could kill all these people if you want. I find how people make threats so interesting because it really says a lot about you the way that you decide to inflect the wording you use and your whole vibe when you say it and it, like there are times when a cold-blooded I will cut every body part off of you is going to make much more of an impression than I will rip you apart, you know, like a screaming. But those threats have their place also. And Bliss, the thing that's so chilling about her is that it doesn't seem to make a difference one way or the other. She doesn't really like all of her involvement in what's been happening feels hypothetical to her. It doesn't seem like she's that invested one way or another, the only time that we have ever seen her exhibit real emotion has been in the most extreme of circumstances or like when that guy Nathaniel, who I guess is maybe responsible for whatever program birthed her when he was brought up and she got really angry. But otherwise, her asking 
do you want me to destroy this island? It said the way that I would ask, do you want that in red or in blue when somebody's ordering something? It's not anything to her. It Like, she will do it and she won't care if you need that. She'll do it. And if you don't want her to do it, she isn't eager. She isn't champing at the bit to use her power. It's not a problem if you don't want it either. Either way, she's fine. And I think that's what I find so scary about her is how completely divorced from any personal desire her actions tend to be. The only time that her actions are motivated in a real way that I have seen is when she's trying to understand the way that regular people think about a thing and react to a thing. And then she'll sort of test it out and see how they respond and ask them questions And she will remember what they reply. She will try and internalize that. But otherwise, it's like, does not matter. Um, Anyway, sorry. So Asher says, I think it has to do with the amount of time they have to invest an item. If the attack was only learned a day or two before, the power of the items would be diminished, I think. So quickly invested items would have a less powerful effect. That's probably true. I just kind of would expect them to have some on hand. Not necessarily in place in preparation for losing Bastion's Veil, but not having anything of the kind would surprise me. And it might just be that there are better, more effective places to use them. That here on this beach isn't necessarily the spot where they're worried about needing continual protection. And because, you know, I assume the consultants have a much better idea on how to do defense than I do. But just the concept of how I would imagine they they guard the island, it wouldn't match with this. And that's fine. It's not a, not a problem. But I just think it's interesting. Um, so finally, Calder reaches a point as he is watching this that he's like, I have got to fucking do something. And he looks over and he sees this other weird ship that is very gold uh empty golden snake skins the size of blankets hung from the railings and virtually every surface streaming in the wind like flags we have not yet seen what the deal is with these snake skins but i just feel like i don't want to know about it just saying when cheska sees the ship she calls them scavengers they'll hang around any battle to see if they can get something out of it and she's very She's very confident in that. But Calder is kind of like, I don't know about this. This is weird. So Calder decides that he's going to engage on shore to try and distract Joran. Because if he does it from the ship, Joran may attack the ship. And he isn't willing to risk his entire ship and his crew. Everybody's on it. So he's like, all right, I'm going to come at him on the beach. And as he does this, Joran turns and casts a very casual attack toward Calder that he is so sure will work that he basically does it and then turns his back and continues fighting with Teach. So that when Calder finally shakes that off and makes it to him and starts fucking with him and screwing his rhythm up... Joran is genuinely shocked, did not think there was any way. And then he sort of seems to realize that it's the armor. Um, And I really do have to say that I love shuffles because before he goes to the shore, he has shuffles like nearby and he says, I'm about to keep Joran from killing Teach and shuffles just yells killing. Um, So... We're, we will get to the moment with Kellerak because he winds up stepping in in the midst of Calder's fight with Joran because Jordan, Joran turns his attention to Calder. And basically, the vibe is Calder's on the edge of losing and Kellerak steps in knowing this is when he is the most vulnerable. And it's interesting because previously... Calder has had to reach out to Kellerak. He has been in desperate situations and had to make a very direct offering. And Kellerak interrupts things himself to draw Calder to him. 
and try and make a deal. And that, for me, really indicates some desperation. So as much as I do not doubt that Kellerak is telling the truth as much as he understands it, I'm starting to wonder how right he actually is about how little free will Calder has. I don't know that Kellerak would be as eager to make this kind of deal as he seems to be if he were as confident as he seems to be. He just, there, it feels like he's undermining his point a little bit. And I guess we'll see. So we go to chapter 21 and it turns out that this is back five years ago when they had just um, gotten Urziah out of the fighting pits. They had gotten him onto the ship and they decide to follow the coast because they're worried that maybe somebody is going to pursue them after they did something that was like hugely destructive as well as stealing a imperial prisoner. And they could, they could perhaps get to land if they stayed close to the shore and hide if they had to. Um, But this, this, there was one thing they hadn't counted on, that every ship in the Empire would be in the water looking for them. Calder couldn't understand it. He hadn't expected anyone to know who had destroyed the arena and taken Urzaya. But just in case someone remembered who'd given the champion a ride over from the capital, he decided to act as though he was being pursued. It was a contingency. He'd been sure it wouldn't happen. But only three days out from Axis, they'd run into the first vessel flying the Imperial flag. The captain had demanded they drop anchor and prepare to be boarded. And so all of this is, it turns out, a reaction to the fact that there is this massive elder attack going on. Which, you know, as we are going to line up, this is going to be right around when the emperor is killed by Shara. Which is, I'm assuming is the thing that when Kellerak says she was supposed to die five years ago after her purpose was served i am assuming shara was put in place to kill the emperor that was her job and then she was supposed to somehow die either maybe as a result of trying to kill him or i don't know i don't know what his idea was on exactly what would end her life and get her out off the board but he seemed very sure that's how it should have gone and i'm interested to see when the emperor dies if there's any ripple effect that they will be able to feel all the way out here once that happens. Um, So they are like really at this point, super bored because they're having to stay in these areas that don't have a lot of like major dangers. They're in fairly calm waters, but they're constantly having to like dodge in a way that's just, super tedious and everybody is starting to get cabin fever and lose it a little bit. Um, And finally, at this point, another ship shows up and Calder is like actually glad that they're about to be having some tension, finally having something to do. So Urzaya, of course, they, they have to hide him and Urziah is so strong that my thought initially was like, well, can't you just like drop a rope off the side of the ship that the enemy isn't on when they pull up and have him just sort of hang out off the side of the ship out of sight until these people go away. And I failed to think about the fact that they might have a reader with them, which they do in this case who, if they put their hand on the deck and just, like, took a minute, they would be able to censor Zaya there, and it would be no good whatsoever. So Urzaya, has they have to figure out a way to get rid of him, and what Foster points out is that there is a town nearby that they could anchor at, Silver Reach. And he's like, I didn't want to mention it because of reasons, which I'm sure you understand. But it looks like we kind of don't have a choice. So maybe that's what we're going to have to do. And Urzaya 
has a very interesting reaction to Silver Reach. He's a lot more serious and intense than he has ever been. Even Andal comments, like, I don't think I've ever seen him speak without grinning and making a joke before. And I find it interesting because the energy that comes off elders, it's not like you have to be a reader to feel it. You know, we're in Shara's head. She's not a reader. And she certainly gets a really strong sense being in the presence of certain beings. Um, but Urzaya, as we know, is so like unflappable that for this to be making the impression on him that it is, I really want to know what kind of danger he's feeling that has this particular effect. If it's just that he isn't used to being mentally attacked in this way, because it really seems like the elders deal in emotional attack as much as physical. Um, but whatever the case, Urzaya is just really, he has a moment where he tells them, I will hide in the closest of the houses and I will stay near the doorway. If the emperor's men search for me, I will kill them rather than travel deeper into the town. When you come to retrieve me, do not enter the house. Instead, call to me from the street. If I do not answer your third call, leave me behind. Now, I want to say a couple things about this here. First of all, <laughs> Ursaya just being like, I will murder every one of their asses before I step foot a hundred more yards into this fucking place. Which, I mean, we know what happened here. And he is not wrong. But also, if I don't answer your third call, leave me behind. And it's not, there's no pathos. There's no, you'll have to leave me. I, you have to promise me you will. It's just this very matter of fact if I don't answer, you fucking know already. So don't be an asshole. Leave. And there's also the fact that he is setting up such a specific plan. I can't tell you how much I love this. This is what like makes me love Lyndon as a character so much as well. I am very into the planning aspect and trying to account for contingencies and there are going to be all sorts of situations in which there isn't time to account for contingencies but the fact that he comes up with something that is so specific and succinct and he's just letting them know here's what I will do and how I will respond if you come and find me don't walk through a doorway where something can jump you or do something I know that there is something going on here and I don't need you guys to put make stupid risks and put yourselves in danger. Just stand outside and yell for me. It's just really thoughtful and makes me think, has Ursaya dealt with something like this before and it just hasn't really come up in his history? Um, anyway, long story short, he goes off in one of the little boats and heads towards Silver Reach. The rest stay on the ship. And a, like, what is it? Second Under Lieutenant Mora Belliard boards Calder's ship and reads it. And he is thinking she's going to be looking for any sign of Urzaya. That it's a very specific thing that everybody has been after them about. And that it's Urzaya. But it turns out that the elder attacks and activity are completely unknown to them. They had no idea on their ship this was going on basically all over the world because he says something at one point about how like, um, oh, well, if this is going on in that one country and she has to say, no, that's not where it's everywhere. Um, yeah, the Azerian coast, surely there's somewhere we can safely make port. They can't be everywhere. She eyed him with an expression he couldn't read. Not everywhere along the Azerian coast, Captain. Everywhere. We've received emergency reports from all over the Empire. 
When I said the Black Watch and the Luminian Order had been mobilized, I meant all of them. The entire guilds, every chapter, everywhere. And she says, take my advice and bring your crew elsewhere. I know navigators are exceptions to most rules, but this town was quarantined for a reason. There's no sense taking chances, especially now. So she leaves, having dropped this incredible bomb of information. And it's just this really interesting moment of like, you expect a particular type of confrontation to take place here. And that doesn't happen. So there's a moment where you're like, this was sort of anticlimactic. But then you stop and realize that they're getting news of basically like the elders rising again. And the climax is simply moved. It's changed. It's still there. This is by no means actually anticlimactic. It's simply not what they were expecting. And the fact is, they have just heard about this when they have sent like their best fighter on alone to an island that has been declared off limits by the emperor, which they think they're going to get in trouble for as well, since she mentions that when she first comes on board. Um, so let's see. Uh, for once, the Aeon Sea was the direction away from the elders, which showed that everything in the world had gone wrong. And here they were in Silver Reach, where they more than expected a great elder was buried. If he'd heard the reports of elder activity before, he would never have stopped here. But here they were, and Urziah was ashore alone. So this is when Shuffle starts laughing. And he's like, oh, okay, that's pretty much all the evidence I need that we are about to get fucked up. And he says, we're going to get our Zaya. Jerry and Foster stay with the, sh with the ship Andal and pedal with me. And everybody is like, what? That's not the breakup that you should be doing. And he makes a really good point and is like, we're going out there and we might not come back. And if we don't, there needs to be somebody here who can fucking navigate and use the liathaton attached to the ship. So I need you guys to stay because God knows what's going to happen here. So they go ashore and all of a sudden, everything that he is sensing completely disappears. It was though someone had reached up and pulled a chain, switching his awareness off like a quick lamp. The world didn't go black. Um, oh, of course, I lost my spot mid-sentence. Um, the world didn't go black. It just vanished as though he'd forgotten to pay attention to anything. When he came back to himself, blinking and looking around, the crew was gathered together in the pool of light cast by a single candle. The whole crew. Urziah, looking around grimly with a hatchet in each hand. Jerry, her mouth half open in awe. Andal, clutching his white sun medallion with his eyes closed. Foster, sputtering and jumping to his feet. Petal, quivering and holding a tiny quick lamp out for light. And him. He realized he had a sword in hand but didn't remember drawing it. And he looks around and he realizes they're standing on tiles and surrounded by bookshelves. And I'm like, oh boy, this can't be good. <laughs> and this, really, the, the way that this all has worked out points to the fact that maybe Calder is not in the kind of control I wish he was of his own situation. Because the fact that they are forced to go ashore at Silver Reach yet again, because they're being chased and have to hide Urziah and that's the nearest place and it just coincidentally happens to be the closest place. It feels too convenient. It definitely feels like this has all been orchestrated to force them back into Silver Reach after having escaped before. And I don't know why and I don't want to know why. I def oh, desperately want to know why I'm lying. But you know what I'm saying. Um, so this is when we go to... The battle between Joran and Teach, Calder's interference. Um, and let's see, Joran blasted him with intent, another gust of freezing wind staggering him in his tracks. The regent followed up with a slash to Calder's face, making him jerk his cutlass up. But it was a feint, 
Joran reversed the strike to land on Teach, and it did land. Teach had thrown herself out of a position to protect Calder, only to take the cut on her armored left arm. And there's a sound like her armor is clanging in response, like she is protected from it. Um, Then he saw the dark scratch on her armor's surface and heard her agonized scream. She never lost her grip on Tearfang, even as she tumbled to the ground and rolled away. So I don't know exactly what's happening there, but I have to assume that considering what this fucking blade seems to be like infused with, only a small cut is still going to fuck her up pretty good. And I'm, I don't dislike Gerilus Teach. It's not that simple. Gerilus Teach feels like, I I want to say that she's like Calder's Carrion, but Carrion seems to have a genuine affection for Shara that Gerilus Teach does not have for Calder. And I don't know if she's quite a Yala, because Yala just seems to care about Yala purely. And Gerilus, I don't know, she seemed to have a real strong personal loyalty to the Emperor based on the way that she reacted when Shara killed him and how upset she was, but it may have been upset for other reasons rather than actually caring about the guy. I don't know. Um, But all this to say, I don't really want to see Gerilus Teach die. I just, I feel really ambivalent towards her in a weird way. Um, So he, the regent, Joran, he slashes the blade into the ground and he kills everything around them and turns it to ash. When Gerilus, her blade makes contact like that, it makes things wither. But this guy, it's straight up things just turn into their particulate molecules and disappear. Um, Joran walked up, a hazy figure, calm and unhurried. If you survive, we'll have a chat about your sword, but I don't mean to pressure you. Life is such a brief candle. And as Calder had experienced several times before, he was suddenly somewhere else. The world shifted around him as quick as a vanishing stage curtain. If you were Calder, and this had happened to you a number of times, and you're in the middle of this fight, and you get interrupted again, What's your reaction? Because I feel like I would just sit up, sit down on the floor and just lay back and like fling my arms out for a second and just be like, oh, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, thank God. A break. Air conditioning. This is so amazing. I just feel like I would start to growing that accustomed to it. It would just be kind of like, thank you for letting me have a breath in the midst of this. Like, can, if he were in the middle of a fight where he was more evenly matched, maybe he would just be like, let me get to the point. Let me actually beat this person before you step in and interrupt. But because he seems pretty well outmatched by Joran and the only thing that's making it even at all is his armor, I would, f- I think I would be grateful to have a break. Um, so anyway... He, uh, once again, Kellerak is there and he says, I once intended to have this built. It's in the center of what you now call the Aeon Sea. And it's this like weird shrine. Um, why didn't you, Calder asked politely. Timing. It's all about the proper place, isn't it? The right time, the precise location, temporal or spatial. If the place is off even slightly, then it might as well have never existed at all. Which, um, I don't know. There's something about the Great Elders and their function in this story that really reminds me of the Abaddon. And it's much more outright malignant and very direct in a way that the Abaddon tend to try not to be but there's a similar feeling of like forces greater than you being involved and being at their whim in a way that makes you uncomfortable so 
Kellerak notes that he, that Calder hasn't destroyed the Aptasia because, and also that Calder thinks that he would be destroyed by it. And Calder asks if it would destroy him. And Kellerak says that depends on a number of shifting factors. Place, as I said. However, I can assure you that even though the throne might be unsuitable, the rest of the network is very much intact. I can find a use for it. Of that, sir, I have no doubt. Calder made the words sound respectful instead of wry. In exchange for your word that you will deliver the Aptasia to me, I can deliver some immediate help. Allies that can save you from your current situation. And it turns out that ship with all of the gold snakeskins is his. And Calder has a moment of like, he wants to offer to help me in exchange for this massively dangerous weapon. No, 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 I don't think so. And he says no. But Kellerak rolls with that and is like, that is too high a price. Um, you recall the consultant named Shara? Perhaps you'll find this price more palatable. I will send you my allies. In exchange, you and they will cut your way through the consultant's guild and execute Shara without mercy or compunction. His calm had slipped briefly, his voice vicious. Afterward, if her body were to find its way down to me, I would be even more generous. And Calder is standing there like, what the fuck? He wanted the Optasia, which is a bonkers powerful item with a very particular use that it makes su such sense he would want to get his hands on and put to use for himself. And the next offer he makes is kill Shara. That's the, the second most wanted thing that he could think of. What is the deal with Shara then? That is, he just kind of has to take a moment and be like, something's happening here that I do not understand. And if he is ready to basically let go of the idea of getting the Aptasia in favor of just getting Shara's body, what could he do with her? What is she? And I think that's a very fucking good question. Because... What I find fascinating about this, we are getting the same information from Kellerak here that he gave to, um, to, I keep wanting to say Jerilus, not Jerilus, uh, Jirene. Their names are so similar and I do that in my head all the time. Um, and either... Kellerak is just trying to influence both Calder and Jirene the same way and make them both work on doing something in particular. Or he actually is concerned about Shara and really does see Shara as a threat. When he was talking to Jirene, I took it at face value that Shara is a threat and that she was supposed to have died five years ago and things aren't going according to plan. And I'm really glad we had that scene because if he were here now asking for Calder to kill Shara, I would think that's reverse psychology. And he actually doesn't want Shara alive or doesn't want Shara dead, but he knows that Calder is inclined to do the opposite because he's feeling a way about being toyed with lately so he's going to say something to get Calder to do the opposite because he's kind of aware of the change in loyalties that Calder has recently undergone. The fact that he's saying the same thing to both of them makes me think this is genuinely true. Plus the fact that his calm slips and his voice gets vicious. That feels like an unintentional loss of control. That's giving away some of his real feelings on this subject. And... I am extremely curious why he wants her body after she's dead. I don't, I can't imagine. 
can he reanimate her and take her over somehow and make it seem like she isn't dead and have her carry other you know what I mean like I do not I can't imagine I just don't think that this guy is the type that's petty and just is like give me your body so that I'll know she's dead I feel like this is a dude who's like give me your body because I have some other shit I could do and I don't like any of that um so this is when Calder begins to realize Kellerak is the one who talked to Jirene and basically encouraged her to kill Lucan. And he says no. And Kellerak for the first time is kind of like, this isn't, this isn't the move, bruh. And Calder says, I have no use for you, you elder spawned filth. And you can shove yourself back into the hole you came from. I'm tired of dancing like a puppet for you. So I'm cutting the strings. If you show yourself in front of me again, we'll see if the emperor's armory might by chance have something that can make a great elder bleed. You turned my wife against me and light and life. I will make sure you pay for it. Oh, my damn phone interrupting my dramatic reading. And Kellerak just says, I am not the one with a price to pay, little king. Yours is a sad defiance. Because defiance requires a choice, and you have none. You're an actor on a stage, speaking lines that have been said a thousand thousand times before. And all of a sudden... Caller finds himself back on the beach and the voice is saying dance on your string little puppet dance how rude wow that is just Calarac is a petty bitch for sure and Calder is a little shaken at the fact that he even is standing there because There's so many stories he's read, evidently, of people standing up to the elders and dying these horrible deaths that he apparently went into that speech knowing that he may not get out again. And that more than anything is evidence of how brave he is, because he was like, yeah, I'm fully aware what could happen. I'm going to fucking say my shit anyway, because fuck this guy. I admire it. I really do. Um, So... Joran walked forward to finish Calder, but his expression changed. He snapped his head up, looking at the ship, and then leaped backwards. Something, someone, enormous, slammed into the ground where he'd been standing. And it's Kern, the head of the Champions Guild, who has brought some friends. And Joran is, like, looking at him going, I don't know about you taking me by yourself and he's mid-sentence with because kern says if you make me use my vessel this doesn't end well for anyone and he's mid-sentence saying particularly not for you if i grasp the and all of a sudden kern comes forward slams the mace into joran's chest or what should have been Joran's chest. Instead, the regent managed to get his half-banded sword between him and the weapon. The force still blasted him backward as though he'd been launched from a catapult. And when he hit the ground, a cloud of black dust and ash billowed up. And this is when Kern says, it's too dangerous to chase him. Let him run. And Calder turns around and realizes that this guy has other people with him. And At first, Calder is saying, thank you so much for changing your mind. I'm really excited you're here. And it comes to light by the end of this little tete-a-tete. He was paid to be here by a mysterious man in a metal blindfold who said that he believed in Calder and had a good feeling about him and convinced him to take a risk here. So Calarac... What I find really interesting here, Kellerak didn't get any deal out of Calder, but he still gave him access to allies, which was supposed to be the reward for a deal. So 
he was trying to make it seem as if Calder was the one who needed an upper hand and didn't have one. And Kellerak was offering him something worth a lot. But as I've pointed out, Calder didn't reach out to Kellerak this time. He was reached out to by Kellerak, who offers him something in exchange for two pretty major deals. Calder says no to both, and Kellerak gives him the reward and allies anyway. This is a tricky fucking guy, man. He's trying to act like you need him, and it's seeming more and more like maybe you don't. I'm interested. I'm just saying. I really do wonder what the fuck it is that he's up to. So I'm excited that these guys are here. I'm really curious if Kellerat can maintain any some like control over these champions or if just buying them is as much interference as he has had. I don't know. But overall... The fact that he clearly wants to keep Calder alive and winning, it looks like it's for Calder's benefit, but I'm just like, yeah, he keeps, he says to Jirene at one point, like, my vision for this land was for elders and humans to live in harmony and for Calder to be king of this land. And it sounds so rosy and, and positive, but what he calls living in harmony. I don't know what that actually looks like. And saying that he wants Calder to be king. Why? What is it about Calder that has him so certain this is the guy? Why does it matter to him what the human is that's in power? Because it seems like he can kind of do whatever. So it's just really like the, the whole bit here feels so different than every other time that Calder has reached out to Kellerak where it um, it makes me wonder if Kellerak simply positioned himself so that Calder knew to reach out for him or because I just feel like he showed his hand a lot in this interaction the fact that he reached out first the fact that he showed Calder what he wants he wants the aptasia he wants shara dead and and that feels like you're giving calder some power over you if you let him know what you're after in any way and then the champions wind up coming to calder's aid anyway even though he didn't make the deal either the deal wasn't even part of it from the start and it was going to just, he took it so for granted that Calder would go for one of these deals that he decided to pretend in the midst of everything that Calder was making a deal when really the champions would show up either way or he wasn't going to send the champions until Calder made a deal Because he never assumed Calder wouldn't. And Calder refusing either deal called his bluff, essentially. And all of a sudden, Kellerak realized that he had not planned for the contingency of Calder turning both deals down and had to do something. And either way, that's very interesting. So... Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But I am enjoying seeing Kellerak scramble a little bit more because that's the energy I'm getting from him is he had things well in hand up to a point and now shit's starting to get away from him a little bit. Um. So anyway, I have to wrap. I'm over time. But Thank you again very much to George for commissioning the episode. Appreciate you. Thanks to you to everybody in the chat. I think Asher is the only one who actually chatted, but it looks like there's a couple other people here. Um, so thank you all. And I hope you're enjoying the coverage. Until next time, this Friday. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.
was an unspoiled network podcast.